A very powerful statement comes out of Newton's second law in its original form. When the net external force, which we know is the time rate of change of momentum, when the net external force is zero, that means the change in momentum is zero. And momentum is a constant. Now, this is only when the net external force is equal to zero. There can be internal forces present, but because they're internal forces, they're, they come in pairs, and we always have an action-reaction pair. When we have a force acting in one direction, we know we have the reaction force acting with the same magnitude but in the opposite direction. So the internal forces will add to zero as well. If P is a constant, that means the initial momentum is the same as the final momentum. And we call this the law of conservation of linear momentum. And it holds true when there are no external forces acting on a closed, isolated system. Now, conservation of linear momentum can occur on one, two, or three axes at once. It depends on where the sum of the forces is zero. If the sum of the forces in X, Y, and Z are all zero, the delta momentum is zero in the X, the Y, and the Z. But even if the sum of the forces is not zero in the X, as long as it's zero in the Y, then the change of momentum in the Y will be zero. And as long as it's zero in the Z direction, the change of momentum in the Z will be zero. So these are all exclusive of one another. Let's look at an example here for a projectile. A projectile in free fall, we know that it's if as it's flying through the air, if we neglect air resistance, gravity is the only force and it acts in the vertical direction. So there are no forces in the X direction. And earlier in the year, we were saying that means the velocity in the X doesn't change. And we see here at all these different time points throughout the trajectory, the velocity in the X is equal to what it was at the beginning, and it's not changing. Well, if the velocity isn't changing, and momentum is mass times velocity, the mass isn't changing either, so mass times velocity, the change in the momentum is zero. In the Y, however, there is a force. That is an external force, the force of gravity pulling down on the object, and so the momentum in the Y direction is changing, just like we see the velocity in the Y direction is changing. Let's look at another example, uh, exploding carts. Uh, I have two carts. One of the carts has an internal spring that I've compressed, and I'm going to push a release button up here, and the spring is going to push the carts apart. Cart A pushes on cart B. Cart B pushes on cart A. We will have the same force for the same time on each cart, and their change in momentum will be the same, but in opposite directions. And the law of conservation of momentum tells us that the momentum won't change. So whatever momentum I have at the beginning, if they're at rest, that zero momentum, will equal the final momentum, which will be the sum of the momenta of each cart. And if it's equal to zero, if I move one to the other side, I see that they have equal magnitude in momentum, but opposite sign. In other words, they are in opposite directions. And if each card has the same mass, then their velocities will be the same, but in opposite directions. Here I've got my two carts. There is a spring in one of them, and I just push a little button, and it pops out, and it's going to push off the other cart. Now I'm going to place the where the carts touch. I'm going to put that right in the exact center. I have a little measuring tape on the, on the uh, track. So I've got two stops on the end of the track to keep the carts from falling off. When I release the spring, they both experience the same force for the same time, so they'll both experience the same change in momentum. Here is the momentum before the event, and that's okay. momentum of zero because there's zero velocity. After I push it, each cart will have momentum, but the sum of the total momenta will be zero. This cart will have exactly the opposite momentum that this cart has. And in this case, when both carts have the same mass, that means they'll have the same velocity as well as the same momentum. And since this distance is equidistant for each cart, if they have the same velocity, we should see them hit 
the end of the track on either side at the exact same time. Now let's try it again, but this time on the cart on your right, I've added a 500 gram mass. So now this cart over here has much more mass, about twice as much mass as this cart over here does. So when they explode apart, they'll still have the same momentum as each other, but in opposite directions. But now since this one has more mass, it will have less velocity. But the product of mass and velocity of this cart will be the same in magnitude as the product of mass and velocity of this cart. Before we look at some examples that are in the book, let's go over some tips on uh, solving relative velocity problems. So here's an abbreviation that is common. WRT stands for with respect to. So the velocity of A with respect to C, we would write that with a V and the subscript AC, standing for velocity with A with respect to C. And the velocity of A with respect to B plus the velocity of B with respect to C is going to be the velocity of A with respect to C. And this can get very confusing. So we'll just learn some little tricks here to help us keep it straight. If we allow these two subscripts on my velocity of A with respect to C, if we allow the first subscript on the first term to be the same as the first subscript over here, and the uh, last subscript of the second term to be the same script as over here, and I've shown that with these blue connector lines, and then the inside subscripts on the two terms need to be the same. So VAB plus VBC equals VAC. And also, if we switch the subscripts, A with respect to C, is going to be the same magnitude, but the opposite sign of C with respect to A. So let's look at an, a simple example to demonstrate this. Here I've got a track, and I'm measuring their velocities with respect to the track. So cart A is moving to the left at one meter per second compared to the track, and cart B is moving to the right at two meters per second compared to the track. What is the velocity of B compared to cart A? In other words, if you were in cart A, how fast would you see cart B moving away from you? So we set it up, the velocity of B with respect to A, using our little formula right here, is velocity of B with respect to track plus the velocity of the track with respect to A. The outside subscripts match the subscripts of this term over here and the inside subscripts are the same. And I see that I know VBT, and here's VBT, so that's fine. And I know VAT, but here the term is VTA. So I'm going to switch the subscripts and change the sign. So I did that. And now I know values for both of these, VBT and VAT. VBT is plus 2, VAT is minus 1, so 2 minus a negative 1. My velocity of cart B with respect to cart A is positive 3 meters per second. Let's take a look at sample problem 9-7 on page 216. In that problem it says we have this hauler in space that hauls a cargo module and it's traveling at some initial velocity and at some later time it separates the module from the hauler. So similar to my carts on the track, there's some device in there that separates them. Uh, I found a similar situation on YouTube uh, of a launching of a satellite. So let's watch it here. Initially, the two are moving together, and then they are separated. And the satellite moves away from the hauler. We'll call it the hauler according to our problem, 500 kilometers per hour. So right here, the velocity of the hauler with respect to the module is 500 kilometers per hour. And 
x represents the center of mass of the system, it's given to us in the problem that the velocity of the center of mass of the system with respect to the sun is 2100 kilometers per hour. So after they separate apart, the conservation of momentum tells us that the velocity of the center of mass is not going to change. That's going to stay at a constant 2100, but now the velocity of the hauler with respect to the module is 500 kilometers per hour. So they want us to find what is now the new velocity of the hauler with respect to the sun. So the book shows one solution. I'm going to show you a slightly different solution. I'm going to use the idea that if internal forces are the only forces acting and momentum is conserved, that means the two pieces, the hauler and the module, as they fly apart from one another, they will have equal and opposite changes in momentum so that their sum of their changes in momentum is zero. There is no change in their total momentum. So I write that as delta momentum of hauler with respect to the sun is equal in magnitude but opposite in direction to the delta momentum of the module with respect to the sun. And change in momentum is equal to mass times change in velocity. So the change in momentum for the hauler with respect to the sun is mass times delta V of hauler with respect to sun. And the change in velocity of the hauler with respect to the sun is the velocity of the hauler with respect to the center of mass. And likewise, the change in the velocity of the module with respect to the sun is the velocity of the module with respect to the center of mass. I'm going to replace the mass terms with their equivalent masses as a fraction of the entire mass. The capital M, standing for entire mass, cancels out from both sides of the equation, and I'm left with the statement that tells me that four times the velocity of the hauler is equal to the velocity of the module. And remember, we can change this negative sign if we switch the subscripts. So 4VHX equals VXM. The reason I did that is because now in this equation, I know the value 500 kilometers per hour for the velocity of the hauler with respect to the module. So I'm going to use my formula that I presented to you, uh, VHX plus VXM equals VHM. And I see up here that VXM is equal to 4VHX. So I'm going to replace this term with 4VHX, and those will now add together to 5VHX. So I divide both sides by 5 and get my value for VHX, and then I can plug it in here, and I know VXS, that's the center of mass with respect to the sun, that didn't change, that's 2100. So my velocity of the hauler with respect to the sun is 2200 kilometers per hour. Now let's look at sample problem 9-8 from the textbook. In this problem, a coconut, initially at rest, is blown apart into three pieces, and the angles between the pieces as they fly apart is shown. Let's strategically choose our coordinate system uh, so that A is traveling along the x-axis. The purpose for that is that because this is an internal force and momentum is conserved, momentum is conserved separately in the x and the y directions. So that means when I calculate momentum in the x, I will only use the x component of velocity. And when I calculate momentum in the y, I will only use the y component of velocity. So by putting the velocity of particle A on the x-axis, I eliminate having to resolve all three velocities. It just makes it a little simpler. And since it's tilted here, I'm going to redraw it uh, in the traditional x being horizontal and y being vertical orientation. Here are my initial conditions. The velocity initially is zero, so the momentum is zero before the explosion. And then the masses of each piece after the explosion, these are the fractions of the total mass that each piece is. And they tell me the velocity of piece C. 5 meters per second. What are the velocities of pieces A and B?
So I'm going to work separately in the X and the Y. Like I said, I know momentum is conserved because internal forces are only at work. So before the explosion, my mo initial momentum is zero. And after the explosion, my final momentum is the sum of the momenta of all three pieces in the X direction because all three pieces have X components of velocity. In the Y direction, however, my final momentum is only going to be the sum of the momenta of pieces B and C because piece A has no Y component of velocity and thus no Y momentum. I'm going to represent their masses with their percentage of the total mass so that I can cross M out of both equations from both sides. On the left side, I have two unknowns, the, velocity, the final velocity of piece A and the final velocity of piece B. But on the right, since the velocity of piece C is known, 5 meters per second, I only have one unknown on the right side in the Y direction. So I can solve that for the final velocity of piece B and then plug that in over here to solve for the final velocity of piece A.